Left West Virginia in the fall of 64. Young man with a burning desire. Well, that was a song I wrote about the trip, actually. In order to get the rhyme I wanted, I had to say 64 when, in fact, it was actually the spring of 64. <laughs> oh, we have to take creative license sometimes. And this is Turley Richards. Yeah. <laughs> I'm his wife, Laura, in case anybody just stumbled upon this and oh. hadn't seen our other installments. Oh, that's right. We didn't say that. Uh -huh. So, uh, yeah, that's who I am. <laughs> Last time I looked in the mirror, was nothing there, but that's who I am. So, anyway, I left, you know, met these women, as I said in the last session, and they invited me to New York, and I didn't know if they were for real or not, but I decided I wanted to go. And how much money did you have saved up? $87. Wow. <laughs> and, a, and a guitar and a suitcase. There you go. How I, old? Uh, 23. Yep, we do some crazy and things. I, <laughs> and I got on a bus and headed to New York, and I got up there like, and, you know, suddenly I, call, I didn't call them tell them I was coming. I just went up there and called them. And they came and picked me up in a cab and took me. I mean, I didn't know what Sutton Place meant then, but Sutton Place was one of the high dollar uh, places in New York, and they had this beautiful penthouse. And uh, little did I understand, I watched enough of, um, uh, what, what's it called, uh, Untouchables. I should have realized something was going on, but they were kept women. And, and they kept you. And they kept me uh, for for most, a reason for most guys would love, you know, to have two women that you're, or you're at their beck and call. Anyway, they you know, took me around to some of the parties, and I sang. I made a lot of good money tip wise. And, oh my gosh, is that not a, the funniest story ever? And we're not going to talk about it here, but that is yeah. the funniest story ever about singing at the big wedding. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, the the boy, the big boys' wedding. Yeah. And I don't mean the Boy Scouts. Yeah. <laughs> but I, you know, I, I sang and I had I got all the money together. But once I suddenly realized that I was being kept and that they really were never going to get me anywhere near record companies. It was just going to be amongst their people. I probably made some good money and eventually something. But anyway, one day I made the decision to leave and I left them a, a nice letter thanking them. And I headed out. <laughs> And within a couple of weeks, I was out of money, completely out of money. I hadn't eaten in five days, and I decided to give blood to, I think it was 25 bucks that we get, mm -hmm. and I passed out. I couldn't yeah. even, <laughs> I couldn't even uh, handle the them trying to take blood. Right. Uh, well, you have a little problem with needles anyway from all the did. eye surgeries. So. Right. And a couple of days right. later, yeah. you know, I, I found myself homeless living in Central Park sleeping with my guitar hooked to my belt loop, you know, my guitar case, and then my suitcase with my pillow. And if it had been 10 years later, I couldn't have done it. I'd yeah. have been killed. But, you know, it wasn't that bad yet, 64. And then uh, I started getting a little bit, figuring what to do. I started singing at places for passing the hat. And there's a fantastic story in the book about an elderly gentleman that you yeah. met there who spent a little bit of time with you during the day and gave you some really... Great really advice. profound advice. Really, yeah. I mean, he uh, advice that stayed with me all my life. Yeah. And then out of there, um, you know, I lived with a bunch of different girls. You know, uh, to they, they actually just took care of me. And there was by the time I got through, there was thirteen of them because I told them my commitment was to music, not to a relationship. And the last one gave me some really good advice when she showed up at a place I was singing. I thought her advice was going to be a fight, an argument, but she handed me a piece of paper and she said, you never lied to me. You always told the truth and I took it wrong, but here, call this man. And it turned out to be my first manager, Norman Schwartz, who also was the guy that turned my name around. <laughs> yeah, so so that was your first like break. Yeah. In the business yeah. and also caused you to have a lucky number of 13. <laughs> yeah, which always was my lucky number. But <laughs> as you see, my life, you wonder, may I should change my number. But anyway, he took me and uh, put me in how much time we had just so it kind of Four stayed. minutes. Okay. Oh, my goodness. See, it's like my TV show was. Um, he took me under his wing and he, you know, he thought I was a great singer and uh, he 
got me a deal with MGM and then eventually with uh, 20th Century. He uh, put me up at the um, uh, Chelsea Hotel, which was what? It had a red, red velvet cake facade. <laughs> Somebody I'm said sorry. that to him and I go, uh, I don't think Turtle would ever say red velvet cake facade. We did mention <laughs> in the very first um, session that we did about changing writers. And, and yeah. so you're getting like little tidbits of why. So, But anyway, <laughs> you know, I was at the Chelsea Hotel, which was a great place to be, which became very famous. And now it's famous for a different reason. Um but, it, you know, I had a place to live. I, you know, I was out trying to do a little singing here and there. And he was, you know, he was getting things happening. I uh, was a great manager. We we butted heads a lot. But, you know, of course, he was stubborn and so, so am I. So I loved Norman all the way until the day he died. You know, we, we parted ways, I think, about you know, 14 months later uh, over a big argument to do with the one album. And then I but all that goes back to what I think we've touched on before that you could sing anything, yeah. and so people were always trying to make you the next so and so. That was the major problem. I, I was I didn't even know at the time that I had a five octave range. I just knew I had a big range, and I didn't find that out till later on. Some guy did a study and found out that I had the largest male range. Lowest note to highest note with no break. That's what. He, that's how he does it. Mm. But the, it was a problem. I could sing jazz because that's what I really was when I went to New York. If I could sing jazz, I was a soul singer back home and some doo wop music, and you know, uh, never sang too much country. But you know, the bottom line is I was a high power dancing. I was sighted then in one eye, and I was dancing all over the place and. You know, but the bottom line is, is that every label when I'd go to the next label we're going to make me the next whoever. Well, one was the next Righteous Brothers, another one was uh, the next Gary Puckett, then another one was the next Glenn Campbell. And I kept saying, why are you making me all these white guys? I know I'm white, but I'm a soulful singer. Why are you doing it? But that's what happened to me. And, and so uh, the problems that you had with Norman were as a result of that, of, of you trying to stay true to yourself and yeah. other people trying to Exactly. And you just weren't happy with the outcome. He got me some of the best jazz musician for us to play R&B, and it just didn't come off really well. But, you know, I learned a lot. I, you know, I've, I've learned, you know, that labels back then signed you differently. I mean, when I tell somebody, I've actually been with seven major record companies. As I said before, I'm either great at getting record deals, but they're they're not great at selling them, you know. <laughs> but I sold a million four hundred thousand somewhere in that ballpark of all my records accumulative, and that's very successful. And I got to tour with some big stars, and you know, I wouldn't trade my career with for nothing. I really wouldn't. And I had a real champion in Paul Cannon. Paul was uh, ended up being my producer on stuff. I don't think Paul was the right producer for me, but he was a good producer. But I think his music was a little too. Uh, for lack of words, vanilla. For he was Johnny Tillotson's producer, and so I think he was better with that. And I'm being kicked. And so, with uh, 30 seconds left, let's tell them where they can get the book and what it's called. Yes, you go to www.turleyrichards.com, and on there is all the places to get my book, uh, to get the uh, ebook if you want that instead of the actual book. Mm -hmm. Uh, there is a CD that's in the back of the book, and also there's a CD that comes with the ebook download, but there are downloads. And I have, what, three or four of my albums on yeah. for download as well. And also, anybody, if you want to pass this to, look for private parties, looking for corporate parties, anybody would like to have me to come, not only sing, perform, but to give lectures and talk about never giving up. Think that's it? I think that's it. So, I was going to what I was left for New York. I was stupid. <laughs> I don't know why I did what I did. Welcome to my world. <laughs> See you on the next one. <laughs>